Okay, well, uh, welcome back after a, a well-earned break. Um, um, I'm Ian Boyd. Um, I'm Chief Scientific Advisor at the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And um, the topic that uh, we're going to discuss now is science advice in the context of opposing political and ideological uh, positions. Um, we have a distinguished, varied and very experienced panel. I'm not going to introduce them all uh, now. We're going to uh, structure this in pretty much the same way as the previous uh, panel sessions. So we're going to have five to ten minutes from each panel member um, and then open it up to the audience. Um, I think it goes without saying that this is a, a pretty controversial area. Um, and I was slightly reflecting on why I had been chosen to uh, take this on. Um, and I could think of two uh, likely reasons. One, one was that, uh, a bit like Anne, I've taken a few knocks in the press on occasions, and I think you have to have a rite of passage to some extent. Um, I think I was compared with uh, Kim Jong-il and Vladimir Putin at one point. Um, uh, and that was just for saying, uh, I, I thought that scientists should try to be part of the solution rather than adding to a problem. Um, I think the second one is that I, I'm very operationally engaged with science advice to policy. And um, just to list off a number of the issues I have to deal with on almost a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly a week-to-week -week basis, um, shale gas, endocrine disruptors, pesticides, animal and plant disease, including uh, bovine tuberculosis, the biggest, uh, we have the biggest bovine tuberculosis problem in Europe, in the UK. Uh, and uh, some of you will be aware that on Monday we issued uh, licenses for a second badger cull in England. Uh, a lot of you will think we're pretty crazy uh, getting too worked up about things like badgers, but the reality is that that's part of the problem. Um, and we have to try to deal with it. But there, is, there are very clear opposing political ideologies about how we go about dealing with that problem. Uh, I could also point to fisheries. Uh, sustainable agricultural productivity is a, a, a major problem in the UK. And uh, climate adaptation. So that's all within my sort of remit and mark portfolio. And I sit down with ministers on a very regular basis, sometimes daily, certainly weekly, uh, to consider uh, the decisions they have to make around many of these sorts of problems. And I think what I want to do in this, uh, hopefully fairly short introduction, is, is, is make three, initially three reflections, talk about three problems, we could talk about many more problems, but I think there are three general problems, uh, come up with two questions that I hope we might be able to address through the panel discussion. And um, I'll just put out a suggestion for a couple of solutions. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say is actually very resonant from a lot of the things that have already been said. Uh, and, and I could have taken bits and pieces of Peter Gluckman's um, uh, introductory uh, talk this morning, and it would have covered pretty much the, the, the whole sphere of what, uh, what I'm going to talk about here, and I guess what many of the panelists will talk about. Uh, but we have a chance here to, to get into this in a little bit more depth. Um, so just to start with uh, sort of three reflections. First of all, um, this, is, this is a bit of a birthday for me because uh, this is exactly two years since I took up this job today. Um, and one thing that I have learned in that time is that government is really hard work. In other words, doing the governance of a country is not an easy job to do. I think in commerce and in academia, we can choose our problems because we can walk away from them. In, in commerce, if you don't make a profit, walk away from it. In academia, if you're not making any progress, you can walk away from it. In government, you cannot walk away from the problems. So you're left with all the wicked problems the downright intractable and the messy. And policy is a messy process. And I think that in science, uh, we are, we are dealing, we're used to dealing with messy processes up to a point. Uh, but I think we don't realize quite how messy it is. And I think as scientists, we like to have organization in our lives. And when we're 
we're, we're, met, we're, we're, we're um, faced with this, uh, uh, this, sort of n th this mess of, of particularly social problems, um, it becomes um, a little bit difficult to deal with. The second reflection is um, often science actually can't help. And we need to be really clear and honest about that. Uh, that can be for a whole variety of reasons. Maybe there's very high uncertainty uh, and the science just isn't there. Uh, it may be difficult or very costly to obtain the evidence. Uh, or fundamenta fundamentally, so often politicians are dealing with an ethical issue which is sometimes dressed up as a scientific issue. And in, in my case, I could um, point to the welfare of animals at slaughter as one of those sorts of problems. Yes, we can provide data to help understand that, but at the end of the day, the limits, the thresholds, et cetera, are a, a decision that needs, the politicians actually need to make and they, they need to, to face up to that. Um, I think we also, another, the, a final reflection is that I think we also need to understand where the real problem lies sometimes. Um, and that a lot of the problems that government has to deal with actually have a very strong social component to them. Sometimes we ignore that. And I could um, point out our management of bovine tuberculosis in the UK. We tend to look at that through a strictly scientific lens, which is about epidemiology. If it was just an epidemiological problem, we could deal with it really quite quickly and simply. But it's got this huge overlay of a social problem. And if you ignore that, then you won't find a solution. Um, and it's interesting how difficult it is to get that into the system and into the psyche of those who are dealing um, with those sorts of problems. So just to turn to three problems, um, and I could have listed a lot more, but three sort of high-level problems. Um, the problem is that science is often brought in too late, and I've heard that already. Um, uh, and there are sometimes very good reasons for that, because sometimes we just simply, um, this, a problem comes from left of center and left of field, and, and, you, and you just don't know it's going to happen. But it can be also because we haven't done the horizon scanning we need to do. And David Mayer mentioned that earlier today um, with respect to, to the European Commission's work. Um, but it's also about making sure that we're commissioning science at a strategic level to make sure that we have basic understandings of the processes that we're dealing with. Um, and one of the challenges I find is making sure that the department I have responsibility for advising is not just simply commissioning science on a firefighting basis, but is actually stepping back from the problem and trying to understand its fundamental nature and then commissioning science to, um, uh, to promote that. Um, a second problem is that science is often asked to address the wrong question. Um, I, I've slightly mentioned this already, but um, one of my experiences actually as an academic scientist and then moving into government is that um, science is sometimes used by policymakers as a displacement activity for not actually facing up to the real problem and making a decision. In other words, it's really great to be able to commission some science, put off an NGO or something like that by saying, well, we're doing some research, uh, come back in three years' time. And then by that time, all the people involved in the policy process have moved on anyway, so they've moved the problem to somebody else. And actually, that happens a lot more than people um, imagine. And again, I, I would say that's a misuse of science, but it, it, it happens, it does happen uh, quite often. Um, and finally, um, uh, and something that is very dear to my heart and that uh, I think it should be a subject of, of discussion here is the problem is that science can very easily become politicized. Uh, and I think this is one of the most insidious problems that we have with science uh, these days. It happens by default a lot of the time. I don't think there's intent there for it to become politicized. But the reality is that if a scientist or a scientific advisor stands up and gives a particular view about something and it is opposite to the view held by somebody else, then that scientific advisor is seen 
by that other person potentially to be politicized. And that can be an insidious, uh, insidious process. So just to come to a couple of questions, um, which I hope the panel might be able to uh, address to some extent. Uh, the first one is, what's the strategic role of science advisors in the context of opposing political uh, and ideological uh, positions? And the second one is, how should scientists behave in, uh, in, in situations where there is political conflict? Just to sort of look at some potential solutions to that, and I'm just putting these up as, as, as ideas at this stage, uh, because others may have, have better ways of looking at this. And again, I think we've heard uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the points I'm going to make. But maintaining the independence of science under political controversy, I think, is absolutely vital. Um, people need to trust the scientists when they stand up and say things, especially scientific advisors. They need to trust that they're neutral. Um, I would say that the science has to be or should be the voice of reason uh, in these circumstances because there are very few other people putting out the voice of reason apart from anything else. Um, but I think that's challenged to some extent by the fact that scientists, maybe not science advisors who are embedded in the process, but scientists generally have a rather low dimensional view of what the problem actually is. And sometimes their advice, um, although well meant, uh, really misses the target quite badly um, and can um, cause more problems than it, it solves. Um, I would also say that science advisors should not be advocates. I think it's really important uh, to discriminate clearly between the role of us as scientists, as citizens, when in fact we kind of, we're entitled to any opinion, um, and the role of scientists as professionals who are custodians of knowledge and who should be partaking of that knowledge in a way that is allowing people more generally to make better decisions. Um, and I think that's something that um, is very confused in the minds of many people, uh, uh, many members of the public, scientists themselves, and certainly the press. Um, and I think as a community, we probably need to get rather better at, um, dis at, at, at describing how we are presenting ourselves when we stand up to speak to the public um, and also as science advisors speaking to politicians. The second uh, potential solution is the, I would call it science governance process. Um, in my case, I have a science advisory council that sits alongside me. Um, it has two functions really. It provides additional expertise, but it's really quite high level and strategic. There aren't many, there's only half a dozen of them, but they are um, trusted experts and they are senior scientists. Uh, but it has a, a, a very important second function and that's to challenge me as the chief scientific advisor and to kind of referee me and my processes to make sure that there is a third party looking in on the integrated science advisory process. Um, and in my case, the, uh, the, the Science Advisory Council is a non-departmental public body, so it has independent minutes that are published, et cetera, et cetera. So it provides assurance to the public that, that the science that is being used within the department I have responsibility for um, uh, is being used properly. So with these thoughts, I'm going to, I'm going to stop um, and I'm going to um, ask um, uh, Gordon if he could um, give us his views on this subject. So Gordon. 